Good morning. Welcome to Inspirational and Aspirational Wednesday Devotional from First United Methodist Church in Mount Gilead, North Carolina. Let us pray. We're thankful, Lord, for the risen Christ and for the beauty of the springtime that reminds us daily that the Spirit of God lives in the beauty of the earth and in our hearts. We've just celebrated the holiest day in Christianity, the day Jesus rose from the dead. He remained with the disciples for only a little while, but Jesus did not leave us when he left the earth. He lives on in the Holy Spirit. Let's look at a couple of passages of scripture that describe what happened after Christ rose from the tomb. The first is from Matthew 28, verses 16 to 28. The eleven disciples made their way to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to meet him. When they saw him, they knelt in worship, though some were doubtful. Jesus came near and said to them, Full authority in heaven and on earth has been committed to me. Go therefore to all nations and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. I will be with you always to the end of time. And again from Acts, first chapter, verses 6 through eight. When they were all together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time at which you are to restore sovereignty to Israel? He answered, it's not for you to know about dates and times which the Father has set within his own control, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will bear witness for me in Jerusalem and throughout all Judea and Samaria and even in the farthest corners of the earth. The Holy Spirit is mentioned 659 times throughout the Bible, from Genesis, when the Spirit of God moves upon the face of the waters, to Revelations. Jesus tells us that we're to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is described as our helper and comforter. But despite the fact that we feel the Spirit in our hearts, nobody can really explain it. We affirm it in the Apostles' Creed that we believe in the Holy Spirit. But what do we mean when we say that? I believe the Holy Spirit is the power that created us and continues to create. That this power pervades all the universe in our own world. It lives in the vast oceans, the stars of the sky, the beauty of the earth, and in all of our hearts. I'd like to share with you today portions of a sermon by Greg Rhodes, who's the pastor of Riverside, River Life Church in St. Paul, Minnesota. He begins by talking about the disciples who had received the word that they were to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Jesus had some pretty thick disciples. Here's a little highlight reel of some of their best moments. John wanted to destroy a whole village for not welcoming them. Judas embezzled money and sold out Jesus. Peter denied that he even knew Jesus hours after saying he would die for him. They fought with each other over who was the greatest. They constantly didn't understand Jesus' teachings. They weren't exactly the brightest stars in the sky, nor the quickest bunnies in the forest. But then, in a matter of months, even weeks after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, the disciples became bold evangelists for Jesus. Listen to their resume post-Jesus. Peter preached, and thousands believed in Jesus. Peter and John 
stood up to the most powerful Jew Jewish council, the same one that had condemned Jesus. Most of them founded and pastored churches. They took the gospel to most of the known world, as far south as Ethiopia, as far north as Armenia and the former Soviet Union, as far west as Rome, as far east as India. Some were tortured, and all but one of them were executed for their faith. To me, just on a personal note, I happen to be a skeptic. Um, I'm sort of like the doubter Thomas. If I can't see it or feel it or experience it, I really don't believe it's true. But to me, this transformation in the disciples is the greatest proof of Jesus' resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit. How did that happen? How did that group of ordinary, flawed, reactionary, prideful guys become world changers. They literally changed the course of history. How did they do it? So what's the answer to the question of how these misfit disciples became world changers? It's in the phrase we're going to look at today. I believe in the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that transformed the disciples. So how do we talk about a topic as huge as the Holy Spirit? The Spirit is present in nearly every book in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. The Bible describes 27 different functions of the Holy Spirit in the church and the life of the Christian. That's way too much to cover today. In the Apostles' Creed, we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I want to start with a brief explanation of the Holy Spirit and then look at one of the pivotal, pivotal passages for the Spirit. First, who is the Holy Spirit? If we're honest, can we just admit that the Holy Spirit can seem a little strange? The Holy Spirit can be hard to understand. Come on, he was called the Holy Ghost up until a few decades ago. Can anyone else find that a bit creepy? The Holy Spirit can be confusing. Let's see if we can make it clear. Who is the Holy Spirit? First, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. To borrow a phrase from a later creed, this means he is co-equal, co-eternal, to God the Father and Son. He is equal in every way and has always been. Second, the Holy Spirit is God's active presence in the world and especially in the church and believer. Another phrase Christians use is God's manifest presence. It's God showing up in a clear and tangible way, but also sometimes in a mysterious way an even miraculous way. The book of God, John records one of the last teachings by Jesus to his disciples. In it, he promises to send the Spirit, whom we call the Advocate, to help them and be with them. When Jesus was arrested, crucified, and resurrected, right before he ascends to the Father, he again talks to his disciples about the Spirit. Jesus, does, Jesus doesn't explain what the Holy Spirit is or why he's giving it to the disciples, but he says two things. Rece receiving the Spirit is near and experiencing the Spirit will be similar to getting baptized by John the Baptist. See how Jesus is drawing a parallel between the two events. In this case, baptism of the Holy Spirit was a kind of preparation for doing kingdom work. Just like Jesus was baptized by John before he started his public ministry, but now it's the disciples' turn to get baptized, but in a new way. I'd like to emphasize a verse from the passage that we read today. 
He said to them, it's not for you to know the dates the Father has the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And there it is. One of the strongest, clearest verses about the Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Throughout Scripture, the Holy Spirit is consistently associated with power. The New Testament alone has a dozen references to people receiving power through the Holy Spirit. I mentioned before that the Bible describes 27 different functions of the Holy Spirit. Giving power to God's people is one of the primary functions of the Holy Spirit. So what are we supposed to do with all that power? The rest of this passage answers that question. Be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. God was empowering them to do his work, preach the gospel, and be a blessing to the whole world. That has always been God's mission. We see it as far back as Genesis, when God calls Abraham to bless all nations. This was God's plan all along. You see, the Holy Spirit is about bringing more of us into God's story, not more of God into our story. When you are living life led by the Holy Spirit, you're more powerful, more effective, more peace-filled, more patient, more kind, more loving, basically more of everything that is good. The Holy Spirit is all about accomplishing God's will, God's plans, God's purpose for you. When you live by the Spirit, you're entering a story that's bigger than you. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you've made him the Lord of your life, then you have promised the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You can do amazing things for God's kingdom. Imagine if each one of us allowed the Holy Spirit to work in our lives for the betterment of this church, this neighborhood, and other churches. Imagine the good we could do together. Imagine the people who could discover the hope and healing of Christ through us and our living in obedience to the Holy Spirit. And to do all of this, we need to remember the Holy Spirit is in you, but he's not about you. He's about the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the beauty of the earth and the glory of the skies. Help us to know you, to receive the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and to share the good news that Jesus is risen by the example of our lives. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.